destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, March 28th, 2023. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Marone Rappaport, editor at Local Call and writer at 972 Magazine on the Israeli counter coup. Meanwhile, six dead, three of whom are children, in a Nashville elementary school shooting. Banking regulators to testify today. As it's revealed that 13 of the $18 billion of uninsured deposits, the Silicon Valley Bank, came from just 10 billionaires. North Carolina becomes the 40th state to expand Medicaid under the ACA, covering 600,000 uninsured people. Fired a Mexican immigration detention center kills 39. Dollar General deemed severe safety violator by the Labor Department. Meanwhile, the National Labor Relations Board brings Chipotle to heel over its union busting. Speaking of which, Howard Schultz is going to make an appearance on the Hill tomorrow. The Help Committee being grilled by Bernie Sanders. Yeah, resigning can't save you. Not when a subpoena is in the offering. <laughs> New York Times sends warnings to its staff who signed an open letter criticizing their trans coverage. Georgia on the verge of passing a law to potentially curb the Trump election interference prosecution. Ginny Thomas helmed an activist group, or I should say the, a Ginny Thomas helmed activist group Got hundreds of thousands of dollars in secret money. Weird. All that and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. Here with uh, Emma Vigland. Hello, Emma. Hello, Sam. It is Newsday Tuesday. It is Newsday Tuesday. Let me just like uh, get my camera um, reloaded here because. Oh. Uh, oh, did I leave? You're gone. Oh, I got to go. Sorry about that. I got to get back in. Oh, um, boy. Yep. Disappeared uh, for a moment. Well, hello. Uh, Technical difficulty. Can you put me back in? It's uh, just me now, but um, we can still hear you, right, Sam? Yes. Okay. I should be able to be heard. Newsday Tuesday comes before hump day. All right. There we go. That's the deal. <clears throat> We're back. We're back. Um, I, I My thing was frozen, and I, I don't know why that happened. Is it better now? It is better now. Okay. Uh, weird things happen sometimes, folks. Um, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, Marone will join us uh, a little bit later um, in, in the program today, Newsday Tuesday. But um, really an amazing story of uh, what is taking place in Israel, and uh, we're going to talk about that shortly. And, and, and I don't want to... I, I I don't want to over oversell it in terms of like you know how broad uh, the implications are you know in, in terms of like the 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 Palestinian people, but it is a sort of an amazing turn of events that's taking place there, and I I don't know. I guess we'll see as to whether it has um, uh, greater implications. Should also say that uh, between Louisville and Indianapolis. Uh, just got an IM about this, but uh, had been looking at this. There are about a hundred in uh, 150, 100 in uh, Louisville, and then another 150 or so in Indianapolis um, who are striking, Teamsters, who are uh, striking against Cisco mm. um, because of their unfair labor practices and um, 
uh, pay. Um, and it turns out that these Cisco is the main food services provider for Jefferson P County Public Schools, the state's largest school system, at least in Louisville. I don't know uh, how that works in Indianapolis, but, um, you know, more more strikes going on around the country. And like I said, La uh, National Labor Relations Board um, came to a settlement with Chipotle. Chipotle had shut down that main branch of a Chipotle when they found out that some of their workers were going to unionize. First uh, Chipotle to file a union petition, too. So it was pretty brazen that they were like, okay, first one's in, we're shutting you down. <laughs> yep. And they've ended up having to uh, pay restitution to all those workers, give them first priority to be rehired if they want, and basically put on notice. I think uh, all of their New England uh, stores, um, they better not do this again. Let's put it that way. And... Um, so uh, uh, good for the National Labor Relations Board and uh, those folks who uh, were brave enough to unionize. Um, by now, I imagine uh, folks have heard this uh, horrible story, the, the latest one, really, in many respects. Uh, according to Gun Violence Archive, which is a nonprofit research group, tracks uh, gun violence with police reports, defines a mass shooting in which at least four people are killed or injured. There have been uh, 130 mass shootings in the United States, essentially in the first quarter of 2023. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Uh, 130 mass shootings in three months. That is more than, more one than a 40, day. Yeah, more than uh, one a day mass shootings. Um, apparently a 28 year old from Nashville, um, went in and we have uh, news reports. We've seen uh, the police chief out there saying um, that this, and the latest reports are that it was a 28 year old trans man from Nashville um, had been staking out this school, had gone to this school apparently, or had some, um, had some uh, resent toward the school um, went in, shot three children and three adults and had plans to do a lot more. Um, and this was a, um, what looks like a, a covenant school, mm -hmm. which is a, um, a Christian school and a uh, covenant school suggests to me also uh, a very fundamentalist one. It's a private Christian elementary school. And um, there was some uh, a question as to the gender identity of the assailant. Um, the chief at that time said the, uh, the, the shooter was transgender, um, and who uh, I believe, as far as we can tell at this point, transgender male. There's obviously a lot more that needs to come out. They have a manifesto, so they'll have a better sense of of, of the reasons why, but, um, again, you know, people do all sorts of, uh, crazy things. The point is, is wh uh, why is it so easy to kill six people and perhaps, uh, kill more? Well, because of guns. However, Tucker Carlson smells a conspiracy here. No. Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carl's tonight. We begin with a Fox News alert. There has been a mass murder at a Christian school in Tennessee. Several people have been declared dead, children and adults. We're learning a lot more at this hour. All the conversation on television has been about the guns that were used, and there may be a reason for that. They don't want to talk about who did it and why. Law enforcement has confirmed at this hour that the shooter was a trans person, a biological woman, identifying as a man. What does that mean? Well, we're gathering new information about this mass killing. Our own Trace Gallagher will have a live update for us. Well, the one thing that we know that it means is that this person was able to secure multiple weapons, including an AR-15 uh, rifle, uh, an AR-15 style uh, handgun. Um, and at least from what I've heard of the latest reports, two of those are acquired legally. Uh, there was another uh, weapon or two. 
and they had a lot of plans to kill a lot of people and um they were not uh armed to the teeth with knives or with baseball bats mm -hmm. or with uh siths or with you know bow and arrows yeah um that that's the the common variable here right um like there's a lot of right wingers trying to parse through the gender identity of the shooter and say this is a part of a larger epidemic. Um, but the common variable in all these shootings is the access to guns in this country. That yeah. is what it is. Uh, I mean, the um, and, and, and the amount of projection associated with that, the reason why people are uh, not talking about the person who who committed it particularly as of last night was because there was a lot uh, n n very little information the reason why tucker carlson wants to talk about the person who committed it is because it is the best way to avoid uh the 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 question of guns in this country and of course you know the uh overtones that somehow uh prayers will uh help defend against uh, these type of things or that um you know uh, somehow um uh conservatives have a better sense of what's going to protect children yeah um that obviously they don't want to dwell too much on that because everyone is susceptible to um getting shot uh by a gun in a country where guns are so prolific i that, mean that's just the bottom line that's the reality and you know <laughs> There's a lot of right-wing focus right now on the pathology of the shooter and I know Benny Johnson, Candace uh, Owens already running with the narrative, of course, you know, trans, if you're trans, you're mentally unwell. If, you, if those right-wingers want to play the numbers game about who's who are mass shooters in this country, we can play that game. But we don't need to because the reality is, is that what the left is consistent on is that we need to target the sale and manufacturing of these weapons and not allow them to be so widely spread. That's the consistent point here. But like they've been priming this narrative about mental health with shootings for a while. They were spreading the conspiracy theory about the Uvalde shooter being trans, which wasn't true. They ran with the Colorado Springs shooter saying, I'm non-binary, which was clearly some sort of like 8chan troll, troll job. Uh, or a way to get around hate crime charges regardless this this is like we're in for a huge swell of being trans makes you dangerous and makes you mentally unwell in in, in the right-wing discourse i just want people to be prepared for it because they've been greasing the runway and here we are here is um uh a clip of gun control activist and shooting survivor ashby beasley uh, on Fox News's live coverage of the Nashville shooting, um, asking uh, reporters if they're tired of uh, of cover covering acts of violence like this one. Aren't you guys tired of covering this? Aren't you guys tired of being here and having to cover all of these mass shootings? I'm from Highland Park. family vacation with my son visiting my sister-in-law. I have been lobbying in D.C. since we survived a mass shooting in July. I have met with over 130 lawmakers. How is this still happening? How are our children still dying and why are we failing them? Gun violence is the number one killer of children and teens. It has overtaken cars. Assault weapons are contributing to the border crisis and fentanyl. We are arming cartels with our guns and our goose loose gun laws. And these shootings and these mass shootings will continue to happen until our lawmakers step up and pass gun safety legislation. I'm pretty sure this was an unsecured weapon that this teenager got a hold of. We can't even pass gun safety, like safe storage laws in this country to protect kids from getting a hold of weapons that they shoot each other with. All right, so uh, we're going to break away there because that reporter who was using that camera is uh, obviously setting up to do a, a live report there. But the woman said it quite succinctly, aren't you tired of this? Yes, we are tired of this. Uh, that's, of course, Fox News in the afternoon. In the evening, they're pretty excited about it because uh, they get to talk about uh, trans people a little bit more. Um, I mean, this is, uh, I, you know... Uh, uh, there's, uh, there is, 
Um, there is very little activity on the Hill about uh, gun legislation. Uh, we also know the Supreme Court uh, is, you know, primed to strike down anything that has any sort of substance and would in any way curtail uh, gun ownership. Um, we're seeing it in, you know, state by state um, uh, situations. And uh, frankly, the only thing surprising about this is that there aren't, uh, uh, you know, enough uh, senators in the Senate who are even willing to take the vote, even though they know that the Supreme Court would strike down anything that was like in any way uh, significant. Yeah. Um, this is the society uh, we live in. And. You know, the um, the idea that people are going to get upset in any uh, sort of significant way for uh, 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 people being killed like this, um, I think in the wake of uh, of covid there is and frankly, and in the wake of of of, of Donald Trump's presidency, um, the regard for human life is just um, much lower i think and i mean let's let's play this clip of um and this is you know uh, unrelated i guess but it is pretty uh, sort of stunning i mean we're starting to see like you know uh the you know we've got clips of of guys going around with um you know on his uh on his truck uh re really on a business truck um, with like basically promoting um, uh, white supremacy. Um, and they're just like, I'm doing this. Like, I, I think there's just sort of like, there's a lot of, I don't know if mask off is, but a lot of the, uh, is the right way to characterize it. But um, the, the dialogue, the, the, the social mores in our society, the value of life, um, we've definitely seen a diminishment. You know, we had a, a, over a million people in this country uh, dead by COVID. Well over. Yeah. And for a significant portion of that, you had Republican politicians saying, some of these folks are chum. You huh. know, these older folks are, you know, they got to make way anyways. Chum so, for capitalism to continue turning on. They're the pro-life party. Like they have stripped so much meaning out of all words, including the word life. Or pro life. Or pro. I, <laughs> I mean, it's just uh, like, this is literally 1984, not to be that person. But like, you know, th they're, they have been immensely successful at completely stripping the context of their brutality out of the discourse. Here, they're they're pro-life, but, but they support this, these mass weapons of mass, uh, uh, of mass killing and, and of just letting the pandemic run rampant so some bosses can get rich. Here is uh, State Senator Mike Wobema uh, from North Dakota. The, um, there is a bill that is uh, going through the North Dakotan Senate that would provide free lunches, if you can believe this, to low-income school children in the state. And, um, you know, best practices are you just you provide free lunches for all the kids. So it doesn't create a stigma for those kids who are um, uh, who, who who don't have mm -hmm. the resources at home uh, to get the nutrition. But here is like you know um, uh, Wobima really articulating something that you wouldn't really hear that often. I it seems to me in the past, right? It's it is one thing to sort of blame the parents. It's another to say like, well, then you're SOL. Senator Wobema. Uh, Madam President, I'll be the ogre in the room. Um, the federal government prints its own money, and yet they've decided that 135 and 180 is the right percentage above poverty rate to provide for meals. North Dakota doesn't print its own money. Why would we be trying to outspend the federal government? We talk about personal responsibility as one of the major um, principles that the Republican Party stands on. Um, yes, I can understand kids going hungry, but is that really the problem of the school district? Is that the problem of the state of North Dakota? It's really the problem 
of parents being negligent with their kids if their kids are choosing to eat in the first place, which is entirely the problem that could be existing here. I don't believe that it is our responsibility to carry on a program in excess of what the federal government already does. I mean, just let's quickly dismiss with the idea that um, it's possible there's just a coincidence that these people, uh, these uh, kids are, um, uh, you know, living within a certain amount of the poverty range. Maybe they just don't like to eat. And so why would we want to give them free lunches if they just aren't interested in eating? Um, but what is the point of a state existing mm. or the uh, government existing? Um, if uh, a federal government existing, if um, they're not going to literally feed children who are undernourished <laughs> like what like what, what's the point why should we construct a society if we don't allow for those kinds of basic needs i, I mean uh, honestly it's like well we've got to protect the uh, property rights <laughs> naturally because we want what because we want society to function and what is the value of a functioning society if it has total it totally feels no responsibility to feed hungry its own hungry children. What's the point? Well, yeah, let's just cut to the chase and and funnel uh, cut all of our government spending, but funnel the rest just to the police who can protect property and crack skulls of of uh, people that might be infringing on wealthy uh, people's land or or ownership. And I feel like a lot of this stuff also gives lie to the whole argument of like. Look how hypocritical they are, or like they don't believe this. This is just completely cynical. It's like even if that, sure, you can grant. Even if we were to grant them that, that's also still sort of an excuse for them. It's still trying to see some sort of benevolence in a person doing something. No, like but he this. goes like, like he says, "I'll be the ogre in the room." Oh right. yeah, he, 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 he thinks he's being very noble by exactly. saying this out loud. Right. I'm making the hard decision. The I'm rest taking, of you are soft. I, I, I'm right. taking yeah. the hard. I'm, I'm, I'm using truth teller. tough love. I have uh, calloused hands from grabbing bread out of children's yeah. mouths. I'll they, be the ogre in the room. Right? Like, yeah. I, <laughs> you know, you guys are, are, are soft and moisturized. I'm rugged as I punch children in the face. It's, it, it, ju it just seems like the callousness... <laughs> People want people want to people even even liberals even Democrats want to avoid thinking people can be this depraved, but they are. Oh, uh, I mean, <laughs> the, there's been uh, many 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 uh, reports of focus groups that will will relate to people, regardless of what their uh, what what their you know political allegiances are. The uh, you know a whole host of Republican policies. And, you know, uh, being tested for ads, for instance. And uh, the ads aren't effective because people don't believe that there would be a political party that articulates these things. I mean, it's one thing to say, like, you know, the uh, the Democratic Party um, uh, is, you know, uh, uh, Joe Biden just okayed the Willow Project, which is going to be incredibly uh, destructive. And he comes out and he says that he did so reluctantly, but there was whatever complications or legal, whatever. Um, at the very least, he knows that he's got to come out and sort of like pretend and pay lip service to it. They still may have very similar, uh, you know, uh, uh, corporate benefactors at, at times, but at least there's a consciousness that we're not going to make it a stated policy. It's always going to be that we're going to, we're constrained from actually carrying out what the, uh, the, the policies are. And, you know, the material, uh, differences are, uh, th there are material differences in the final analysis when that's your perspective, but the idea that it is a point of pride. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be the ogre. That's the way I'm going to enter. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I am going to be the one who's really the only truth teller here. Wow. Why are we taking care of poor kids when they can't eat? Isn't that the responsibility of the homesteaders? You know, like why even have like, like a, what, what, you should shut off the federal government from, uh, you should, you should stand at the border and keep that federal government from not bringing that money in because it's just softening these kids up. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> another reminder that the right wants to make every public institution as inhospitable to 
regular people as possible, wants to stratify it along class lines, push others out that they don't feel are deserving of being power players in the society. And they start with public education um, and just like cutting these kinds of things for for school lunches is the genesis of, or is at the heart of that. All right, uh, we're going to take a uh, quick break in a moment. When we come back, we'll be talking to Marin Rappaport, editor at Local uh, Call, writer at 972 Magazine about what's going on in Israel. Uh, but first, a word from our sponsor. Um, I haven't put up that uh, that uh, video yet with the um, what was it? What was it? What was that call that I got? Like an Amazon scam? Oh yeah, it was some scam where uh, I got a call where I supposedly ordered. Oh, that's what it was. Like a you know one of those calls. Like we you you ordered a, uh, a computer and ear pods, <laughs> and uh, if do you want us to cancel that order that you ordered? <laughs> Um, if so, give me your credit card. And now I don't, uh, I don't, uh, fall for that. Um, what I do is I videotape it, but it's not uncommon that people do. And it's not uncommon that people, uh, give up by mistake or somebody breaks in, uh, gets their identity, gets their social security numbers, get, starts with a password and an email. Um, and, uh, the, the, the best way that I keep all of my stuff uh, safe online uh, and offline for that matter is Aura. Aura is an easy to use app that includes everything you need, again, to stay safe online, but it also really protects you offline. It protects you from scammers and hackers by scanning the so-called dark web. This is where uh, criminals sell stolen information, including your email, your passwords, and your social security numbers. And if it finds anything, it alerts you fast. That way, you know, in the real world, you need to, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, lock down your credit cards or uh, change your passwords, your emails. Um, they help you fight back against those websites that make your personal information public by um, sending automatic uh, removal requests on a regular basis. Helps reduce robocalls. Helps reduce, um, I mean, it also helps ha uh, preventing your... your personal information from being public mm -hmm. uh, or it gives you near real time alerts on suspicious credit inquiries. So we set up a bank account for Mila uh, theoretically to save money. <laughs> and um, I got uh, alerted that that had happened because this protects me against somebody opening up a loan or a credit card in my name or for that matter, a bank account. Although someone wants to open a bank account in my name, I'm not sure why that would bother me. They kept putting money into it. Oh, yeah. But nevertheless, it's good to know what's going on. They got a VPN that allows you to stay anonymous online by keeping your browsing history and personal information safe and encrypted. They also have uh, spyware, malware, and virus protection uh, uh, built right into the app, uh, which protects your devices. Or also even helps you uh, manage what your kids are doing online by restricting their, uh, their specific apps. You can set screen time limits. You can set focus time to make sure that they're doing their homework instead of watching those insufferable YouTube shows that Saul likes to watch. Uh, they have a password manager. Let's you well, also for your kid too. It right, wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to have control of what Saul watches. All that that would be pretty funny. Um, they have a password manager that lets you store and access your online passwords securely and conveniently. And like I say, you might have an app that does one of these things. Well, Aura uh, does all seven. Uh, let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online. If you sign up right now, Aura is going to give you a two-week free trial with my link. You're going to be shocked at how much of your private information Aura finds exposed over those two weeks. All you got to do is go to Aura.com, A-U-R-A, dot com, slash majority, start your free trial, uh, put your email and uh, address in there, and you will uh, get a sense of just how exposed you are. Uh, we will put a link to that at the bottom of the, uh, the YouTube and uh, podcast description, as well as on the uh, majority.fm website. Quick break. When we come back, we're going to be talking to Marin Rappaport.
We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Uh, joining us, Marin Rappaport, editor at the Local Call, writer at 972 Magazine. Uh, Marin, welcome back to the program. Thank you. How are you? Uh, um, uh, well, and I, we spoke to you last uh, almost 30 days ago. I guess it was March 1st. Um, and at that point, there had been already a remarkable amount of, of protests happening in Israel um, over um, essentially a plan by the Netanyahu government to really disempower the uh, judiciary in Israel. It would have allowed the uh, 61 members of the Knesset, a simple majority uh, in a government that only forms if you have a majority uh, in this instance to overrule anything the court said. Um Give us a sense just before we get into what has happened over the past 30 days. I know this is going backwards a little bit, but for folks who have not been following this, give us a sense of just like what was behind the the, the desire to do this. One of them, I think some people attribute it to is that uh, Bibi Netanyahu is facing criminal charges and it would be nice to be able to say yeah, the court, eh, we don't need to listen to that. Yes, of course, you know, the personal issues of uh, Netanyahu are important. We don't know how much, of course, but I think it certainly played a role. But I, I, I would say that the, the resentment against the court and uh, especially the Supreme Court is something quite, uh, uh, you know, goes back, back uh, at least 30 years uh, especially on the ultra-Orthodox and the Haredim uh, Jews in Israel uh, that feel that the court has, uh, has imposed on them all kind of issues uh, that regard equality. Uh, and, uh, and also the settlers. The settlers are a group uh, that uh, feels that the Supreme Court has given uh, a uh, support to Palestinians sometimes uh, regarding settlements. Uh, it's very limited to say the truth, but the settlers felt that they don't have a free hand with uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, and maybe there's a, another general, you know, resentment against the court that is something, you know, I think is not unfamiliar also uh, uh, among the, the, the Trumpist uh, right in, in, uh, in the US. So, you know, th there is this resentment against the court, against the law. Uh, uh, so it, it's not only Bibi's Netanyahu uh, private issues, it's something deeper. And and I and I think we we get that you know that that has become I think sort of like uh, broken out in the open a little bit um, over the past twenty four hours at the very least. Um, but uh, but we'll catch up to that. Would those uh, parties uh, that we're talking about here, particularly the uh, religious fundamentalists um, and the um, settler nationalists, um, do they describe themselves as anti democratic? I mean, Israel does not have a constitution, which is also going to play big into our conversation. But um, and, and in this country, um, those forces, I think, are uh, at least by act uh, anti-democratic, um, but they don't articulate it in part because it's so closely associated with a, a sort of a patriotism. Uh, it's nice to sort of like address yourself up that way. Do they feel that same uh, uh impulse or need to to market themselves as uh as as democratic or, or are they openly undemocratic no i think uh, uh they uh, describe themselves uh, you know the haredim the the ultra orthodox is something else because their parties is of course uh, in themselves are, are non-democratic you know there's no election internal election and you know they're appointed by a group of rabbis that uh, appoint the knesset members the, the least uh, to to the knesset to the parliament so uh, but uh, on the contrary uh, uh, Simcha Rotman, who is the head of the Judiciary uh, uh, Committee in the Israeli Parliament, is part of the what's called the uh, uh, the religious Zionist uh, party, head, headed by uh, Bezalel Smotrich. He claims, 
and also Yariv Levine, the justice minister uh, from the Likud party, they claim that they represent the true democracy, the, the direct democracy uh, style uh, Athens, you know, like, like, uh, like uh, you know, the really direct uh, uh, democracy, who is, uh, who has the majority can decide and no one uh, should be allowed to interfere in the decision of this majority. So they claim that they are a real uh, uh, um, expression of uh, direct and true democracy. I mean, there's there's some argument that that's you know intellectually defensible because there is no constitution. They don't necessarily have. Uh, there is not necessarily a history, and certainly in practice, like you know the uh, of. Um, a problem with the tyranny of the majority, uh, like we, we have in, in at least in American sort of philosophical, if you will, uh, thought, I guess. Well, I would also just put the caveat that it's only intellectually defensible if you, in the confines of this conversation, exclude Palestinians entirely from the democracy. Well, that also, yes. Yes. Of course. We, we, first of all, uh, uh, there's no... Uh, uh, as there is no constitution, there is no safeguard for uh, any minority. Of course, the Palestinian inside Israel, I'm talking about first about the Palestinian citizens of Israel, the 20% minority of Palestinian citizens of Israel, and of course, and women, not, not a major, minor, minority, and other groups uh, do not en enjoy any, because there is no constitution, they, there's no safeguard. Uh, that the, the 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 Knesset, the Parliament, will decide uh, any laws that will infringe on their rights, and added to that, of course, uh, as was rightly said here, is as the fact that Israel controls uh, four million Palestinian without any rights in the occupied territories, especially in the West Bank, but also to a certain extent. Uh, the the people of Gaza, so uh, they do, do, are not part of this democratic game at all, uh, and they are not defended at all. So uh, in this case, yes, uh, uh, this this uh, seemingly majority is 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 really a farce because uh, uh, Jews uh, are a minority between the river and the sea today. Uh, the Palestinian are uh, uh, the majority, a small majority, if you consider the Palestinian citizens of Israel, the Palestinians in the West Bank, uh, Jerusalem, and Gaza, they are a majority. So uh, it's really uh, a minority that acts as if it is a majority and wants to have also a tyranny of the majority. So therefore, it's really, really absurd. Well, uh, my my question for you, though, is how what are secular Israelis most worried about then with this judicial overhaul? Because from the outside, I think it's easy for us to say, look, it's fascism turning inward in Israel, which was always going to happen, given the extent of the apartheid. But what are the direct threats that uh, secular, more moderate Israelis feel from this being kind of spearheaded by the far right Netanyahu coalition. Well, uh, the, the the Supreme Court, to to a certain extent, did uh, uh, um, uh, shirt certain rights uh, for secular uh, uh, Jews or secular citizens uh, in Israel from uh, rights for 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 LGBT. B rights for rights for 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 uh, uh, many other issues uh, um, uh, that the, the the Supreme Court did uh, interfere and also to a certain extent very little but still to a certain extent for the rights of uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel for example there was some a sort of a ban on Palestinian buying lands in p parts of Israel inside Israel I'm not talking about the West Bank and the Supreme Court uh, uh, um, disallowed this uh, this uh, ban so so the Supreme Court did do many things but you have to understand that the atmosphere that the new government created uh, 
from even before this reform was launched, uh, the atmosphere was really aimed at people felt that they are really threatened because there were uh, 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 low propositions not yet uh, 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 adopted, like uh, uh, women who would go uh, to the Western Wall uh, in um, in in unmodest way should be jailed. That was uh, uh, a proposition by one of the uh, ultra orthodox parties. Uh, there was also. Uh, uh, signed in the coalition agreement that a, a, a completely homophobic uh, a member of Knesset will be in charge of all the uh, uh, educational program in the Ministry of Education. So there was this attack from the very beginning, not all of it uh, uh, directly connected to the reform itself, but the atmosphere was that secular Jews, secular the seculars in Israel in general, are under threat. Now, again, there is, uh, I know <laughs> there are many who will say, uh, yes, Zionism was not democratic from the beginning. That's correct because it disregarded the rights of the Palestinian, of the native Palestinian. But you have to remember at the same time that from 1920, from the beginning, right after the beginning of the British mandate, there was the first elections for a sort of parliament for the Jews in Eretz Israel, in Palestine. So the tradition, the democratic tradition of this may be elite, but uh, uh, that uh, uh, from the beginning of Zionism, there is a strong d democratic tradition of 100 years. So uh, uh, just, you know, wiping out this tradition was something that f people felt, wow, what's going on? All right. Well, let's let's just do um, let's do a little bit of a of a TikTok over the past like forty eight hours, if you will, so that people get a sense of uh, of just like how you know. And 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 when we again when we spoke f almost four weeks ago, uh, we were seeing a hundred thousand, sometimes close to two hundred thousand protesters a weekend, and for a country like Israel. That's, you know, the equivalent of like three or four million people a weekend going out in the United States and having these protests over the weekend. This past weekend, uh, the numbers I, I, I was reading were like close to 500,000, which would be like 18 million people protesting in this country. And uh, it is it's extraordinary numbers. And then what started to happen, it, it appears, was like members of the military uh, were basically saying, and I don't know if folks know this, but uh, but there's everyone uh, in Israel uh, at age 18 goes into the military automatically. Um, and so this is a big deal. W walk us through some of that and get a sense so that we can get a sense of like just exactly, you know, when the threshold was met that Netanyahu had to say, we're going to take a pause on this for a month. Yes, uh, it's really extraordinary. It's it's the most extraordinary, I think, uh, uh, civil uh, uh, protest that Israel has known since '48. Uh, nothing similar. Uh, we are talking. Yes, in the last weekend, some people say it was even 600, 650,000 went to the streets. It was completely decentralized. There was no really, uh, you know, it was all kind of groups, uh, um, high-tech people, uh, ex-soldiers that were, high-tech people that were afraid that the high-tech industry will be hurt. Ex-soldiers who were afraid uh, uh, that, first of all, the government maybe will send them to missions that they cannot uh, fulfill. And and in generally speaking, they say, we are soldiers, we cannot be a soldiers in dictatorship. Uh, and the numbers grew and grew. The military was very important in the sense that thousands, thousands of re Israeli reservists 
and you have to understand that the Israeli army is built very much on reservists, especially the Air Force, uh, 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 thousands announced that they will not serve. This is really unheard of. You know, the, 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 the numbers of all those who refused to serve in the Israeli army since the occupation, 67, occupation of the Palestinian lands, is something in the hundreds, maybe in 56 years. And now in one month, we are talking about thousands. So really it was immense. And what happened is that uh, to, uh, uh, the, ministry, uh, the Minister of Defense, uh, uh, um, Yoav Gallant, Likud member, uh, was really under heavy pressure from the military, from his companions, I would say, uh, colleagues, uh, 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 to, to go against it because there was a real feeling that the Israeli army will collapse, not, nothing less. You know, people were talking about the Israeli army, uh, uh, or at least the Air Force, uh, collapsing. So he issued a statement that he wants uh, uh, the reform to be um, postponed for a few weeks. Netanyahu, in a completely irrational move, fired him two days later, just a day before the, 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 uh, uh, the law, the first of the laws of the reform, one concerning the committee to appoint judge, judges was supposed to pass, he uh, fired him just a day before. And I would say in a span of 15 minutes, I'm not exaggerating, 15 minutes from the moment that uh, uh, it was announced that he is firing the, uh, his Minister of Defense. There were hundreds of thousands of Israelis in the streets all over the, the country. Tel Aviv was blocked. The main uh, 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 highway uh, belt, the, the belt uh, highway of Tel Aviv, uh, that is really the most uh, uh, busiest uh, road in Israel at all was blocked for something like 10 hours uh, by tens of thousands of people burning barricades, building barricades, burning woods, really scenes that we have seen maybe in the West Bank. Uh, uh, and uh, that was like this all over the country, even in cities that are considered Likud, that leaning for the Likud, like Be'er Sheva, uh, uh, Natanya, and other cities that are considered very right-wing uh, uh, cities. So it was really a, 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 a reaction that no one, no one has ever seen in the history of Israel. And Netanyahu really had to bow down and uh, the next day he announced that uh, he is postponing uh, uh, the, the passing of the law and there will be, start now a process of negotiation in order to reach uh, uh, an agreed upon reform. And, and, and who are they supposedly negotiating with? I mean, I want to talk about this push for the Constitution because that seems to have like sort of like grown over the past three or four weeks. But before we get there, who who are they negotiating with? And um, it also feels like uh, Netanyahu not only made a massive mistake in firing the defense minister because of the, you know, the nature of the Israeli uh, sort of psyche's relationship with the military. Um, because, you know, it for, uh, you know, the, at least the, the first, you know, uh, 25 years or so of, of Israel's existence, that was like an existential relationship, uh, with the military. Um, yes. uh, the, with the talk about the right wing coalition that he has built because he, this coalition does not seem to be, uh, amenable to um to to uh you know any type of negotiations um and I, i'm not i'm not saying that anybody on the you know nominal center or left should negotiate frankly either 
but they seem very much in transit and that th this is like this is what we're here for and if we don't get this there's no point in it yes there is this feeling there is this uh, uh, atmosphere um, in the right wing, in the Likud and the other parties of the coalition, right wing co uh, parties in the coalition, that we are uh, we were elected in order to pass this reform, uh, punto basta, as they say in Italian, you know, and that's it. Uh, um, I still now uh, the uh, they do, and, and because of that they refuse to negotiate the whole time the whole of this three months despite the growing uh, protest now they are forced to negotiate it is very difficult to uh, uh, see a compromise but you know they negotiate first of all with the parties the center left parties Especially Yeshatid of uh, of uh, Yair Lapid and uh, and uh, Benny Gantz uh, um, and Benny Gantz, but uh, uh, but you know the protesters, although it's a completely unofficial body and not unorganized, you know they supervise these uh, uh, politicians from above. It's not the other way around. It's not the politician that affects. The protesters it's the other way around so i think that the chances uh, of, of a compromise are slim especially and i will you know touch the point that you mentioned already especially as the protest especially in the last weeks uh, the new demand was not only to turn down this reform but to go back to the history of israel that refused to pass a constitution from its early days, from 48, because it was afraid from the idea of equality for Arabs and also, in a way, for women, because uh, uh, ultra-Orthodox were given extra rights. And so to pass, the, the, the calls came from the protesters themselves now it is adopted by Yair Lapid and by the president Yitzhak Herzog to pass or a, con a constitution or at least a basic right, uh, equality, guaranteeing equality. This, I think, will be hard, extremely hard for the right wing to accept because it really contradicts everything that they believe, on, believe in they don't believe in equality, they certainly not for Palestinian and also not for secular Jews and not for women. So I don't see them accepting this uh, uh, demand. And uh, the biggest the, the, the compromise, I think, will not be achieved. The question is, will, uh, after the, the efforts to reach a compromise will fail. Will Netanyahu try to reenact the same reform that was uh, uh, proposed before and risk a much larger uh, uh, protest? Or that he will back down and uh, risk uh, that his uh, government will fall apart? Uh, the Well, and the other question, though, it, it seems to me is, is there momentum for this push for a constitution right i mean uh, israel was given uh, through the 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 you know a, a, a mandate that uh, and sort of came out of a british system on some level so the the absence of the constitution had some like sort of um justification beyond the the idea that well, equality also might be a slippery slope mm -hmm. um in this instance and i'm and i'm quite convinced that a a the, the day a constitution, if it was ever to occur, w would be passed in Israel would not be a panacea. But I do think that there is a an argument uh, if I'm a uh, if I don't want to offer uh, not just equality, you know, even if I was to believe that like, OK, OK, equality, you know, for the secular Jews in the women. I mean, we can we can haggle over that. Uh, but as long as we don't give equality for uh, the Palestinians, like, I don't think you can quite do that. I think once you open up that door to a constitution and have a mechanism that sits apart 
from where the sort of like electoral political power has. I think it's a real threat to, you know, the the current system that Israel has where it subjugates and ignores the existence and, you know, at least as a citizen of the majority of people that they control essentially in their government. Um, so the real question is how, um, how, how, cl- how close, how, how, how significantly has been that concept of having a constitution been adopted? Like, is there a new position of you're not going to get a hundred, 200, 300,000 people off the streets unless we get a constitution because we're aware now of what could happen. Because I mean, in all honesty, like, okay, even if, if Netanyahu backs down in a month, what's to say he's going to do in three months or five months or six months or 18 months or two years. Like th- this is the trajectory the country is on. I, I, is that apparent to, to at least a significant portion of people? <laughs> It's a very, in this sense, I think we are in really a very dramatic and maybe historic moment in the history of Israel, maybe maybe in the history of Zionism. Israel from its start, and maybe Zionism, was based this way or another on the concept of some kind of Jewish supremacy. That was, you know, even if it was not stated officially in in law, uh, that was the idea. It was, in a way, uh, uh, institutionalized in the nation state law in in uh, t- uh, uh, 2018. But uh, that's really part of the identity of the state of Israel. It is certainly the ideology of this government, of this coalition. That's, you know, what cement them together is the belief that Jews have a rights for supremacy, that this this state should be Jewish. And if it can be democratic, that's okay. But first of all, it has to be Jewish. And therefore, having a constitution or even a basic uh, law uh, of uh, equality is something very dramatic that could change the character of Israel, not only of this government, but the character of Israel from 48 onwards. And therefore, it's a huge issue. What is really interesting here is that, yes, I feel and it's very hard to say because it's everything, as I said, is very decentralized. There's no group that you can, there's no one person that you can go to and say, listen, we should go for that and right. convince him or her. It does not exist. It's completely decentralized. But I feel that the mood of these tens of thousands that really went to the streets, confronted the, the, the police, were ready to be arrested, get hurt, and maybe even get killed. I'm not exaggerating. People were ready to get killed that have their life to pay in their life for this. The atmosphere, the mood is yes. We want to set new laws, new rules for this state. It's not enough to go back to January uh, uh, 2023 before the reform was proposed. We have to really, you know, restructure Israel in a more just and equal way. I feel this is the atmosphere. Now, whether this really forces that come from below will have enough force, enough stamina, enough, you know, endurance to push forward for such a dramatic move, I don't know. Uh, uh, the stakes are extremely, extremely high as I as I presented now. But yes, I see new awareness, even among, and this is really strange, even among these pilots who bombed in Gaza, bombed in Gaza, and are bombing now, or in Lebanon, or in Syria, or were supposed to, to bomb in Iran, Saying no, we, we need we need equality is something we have to uh, uh, to, to to 
reform this this state on a more equal footing. Now, there's an I asterisk. There's an asterisk there that it, it you know, the 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 asterisk being who we're talking about giving you know who is the cohort that we're allowing for for equality. But I think you know uh, you and I are probably and I think we 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 all agree that once you introduce the notion of a of a codified call for equality and we've seen it in this country right i mean you know it's taken a very long time but we started with uh with slaves and um we had this uh, aspiration for equality all men are created equal it took it it took a long time but you know uh we're also in a different era and the the progression of these things you know happens uh I, more rapidly I think, I think words do have meaning you know, yes, there was a lot of criticism for more... Well, particularly for, when they're written in the Constitution also, and they have the power the of law. Radical, from the more radical left and also from Palestinian citizens of Israel and in the West Bank. That they are talking, when they are talking about democracy, these protesters, they're talking about democracy for, uh, for Jews and they're talking about equality for Jews. And there is something into it. It's not completely baseless, but I do think that words do have meaning. And once you say, I, democracy or rebellion, that's, you know, the, 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 the main uh, a slogan shouted in the streets. Democracy. Once you say, what is important to me is democracy. What is the highest value for me is democracy and equality. Then I think there is a chance that you will go further for, first of all, for equality for Palestinian citizens of Israel. And I'm, I'm confident, but I'm an, well, an, I, uh, I have my concerns. An, an, an optimist without any reason that it will also uh, uh, refer to the Palestinian the West Bank in the end. But, but there is a concern to me that any kind of document in the short term under this current uh, apartheid right would only further congeal the existing uh power dynamics as opposed to a more revolutionary process in which say palestinians have equal stake it, it all it the concern would be that like we see this in the united states democracy some of these equality it's defined very differently by the right than the left defines it right and so it, my concern would be that this would be a way to put additional barriers on ending the occupation. I, I, I'm, I think that adding additional barrier, I don't think it will happen. The barriers are so high uh, today yeah. that, uh, that uh, equality and constitution will not add barriers. But you're right in saying that there is a real danger that it will not address these core issues, that it will not address the core inequality uh, between Jews and Palestinians. There is this risk. But I think, first of all, uh, uh, I think, as I described before, the very notion of bringing in this, these ideas into the uh, legal debate is very important. But it cannot, you are right, it cannot end there. It's not something to discuss procedures. No, we have to go much further to change the mentality of the Jewish majority in Israel to have new thinking. It goes, I think it will have an expression in the law, in the constitution, in basic law. But the process is much you know, wider and that will aim at changing the mentality, the way Jews think in Israel and understand that they are not uh, superior and have no uh, uh, privileges and should not enjoy any privileges not inside Israel and not between the river and the sea uh, 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 with the West Bank, uh, East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip.
Has there uh, ever been any type of popular movement that has uh, called for a constitution in Israel's history? I mean, I know that there's been like intellectual movements maybe within the context of like uh, universities and uh, it, it's an interesting debate occasionally to have. But has there ever been any type of like popular movement at all for a, a, a constitution? And And we should say that like. It is so hard to imagine this government or anything in a re, you know, reasonably facsimile setting up a constitutional convention. It's so hard to even imagine how that process would exist uh, in the Israel as it's currently constructed. But it's part of the. But it's also sort of hard to imagine, like where we are today versus four months ago. Um. There were uh, some parties in the 90s, uh, more centrist, by the way, more, uh, I would say, bourgeois parties uh, representing the more uh, bourgeoisie in, uh, in Israel, more centrist, that wanted constitution. But that was mainly, you know, uh, private, uh, private property and, you know, and secular, and secular. So, but they never, you know, there was never mass movement, you know, hundreds of thousands in people in the streets shouting constitution, shouting, uh, you know, the the the, the, uh, the cry uh, uh, while they were taking over this uh, this uh, road, this uh, uh, belt roadway uh, around Tel Aviv. The main uh, uh, slogan was, if we don't. If we don't have equality, we will topple the government. So this kind of thing, I don't remember, not in the size and not in the intensity and uh, courage of these protesters that are ready, really, to fight, be arrested, get hurt, and maybe even worse. So no, I don't think there was anything like this. Now. The chances, as you say, the chances that the East current Israeli government will <laughs> will accept the constitution are non-existent. The chance that, that it will start a process for uh, 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 basic law of equality are very minimal but existent. There are other options, but uh, if we will have some something of it, it will be a huge win, a really huge win that will have uh, consequences far uh, uh, beyond uh, this uh, this crisis. Um, what, uh, so what, what is next? What are you looking for next in terms of like trying to assess what's going to happen? Or is it just one of those things where it's, we're in uncharted territory, so there's really no even uh, signposts. You know, I'm I'm uh, I'm a journalist for more than thirty years, uh, so I follow Israeli politics for many years. I've never experienced anything like it, where you know, in the morning, you don't know what will happen in the evening, and I'm not not talking about war, you know. There were wars, there were a military operation. I'm not talking about this. I'm talking really about, you know, development inside the Israeli society, so swift, so huge that it's very hard to predict. And it's hard to predict the will, you know, talking, I, in this conversation, I was talking about what the protesters want, but there are 600,000 of them. So, you know, anything to say, what do they want? Is is ridiculous. How do that? How do I know what these six hundred thousand people want? But I think, uh, the, as I said before, I think that the, the uh, I would uh, expect that uh, um, a compromise will not be reached, and that the government will maybe try to pass some law. It will fail, I think. Uh, and uh, the government will have to face a crisis, an internal crisis, and I think Netanyahu will go, we will have an election, 
in the beginning of 2020, 24, I think, or maybe even at the end of this year. This is my uh, guess, but again, we could go for very dramatic and uh, uh, terrible scenarios. You know, uh, there was an agreement now, right after Netanyahu announced that he will uh, 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 postpone the, the, the laws. He uh, had an agreement with uh, Itamar Ben-Gvir, the head of the Kahanist uh, party, to have some to form some kind of a private militia that that will be under his control as a minister, uh, and we could have something like a fascist militia armed with with official uh, uh, weapons, an official militia headed by the most extreme, racist, violent politician in the history of Israel, attacking Palestinian Jewish protesters, we don't know. So I think Netanyahu now went into uh, um, even more than a coalition into really a very he he decided he's opting to go with Bengvir, with the more fascist wings of the Israeli right, and I, almost abandoned his classical traditional Likud party, which has the element that are more conservative, but not that radical. So it could be very very dangerous. Well, you just, I mean, uh, for, for uh, I mean, I'm old enough to remember uh, 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 Mayor Kahan, uh, um, who, and, uh, you know, who was, when I was a kid, just considered a, a really fringe lunatic. Uh, the idea that he, his party has achieved this level of power in the government and is now being given an okay to have, uh, you know, I don't know what what do you call? Uh, 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 I mean, a ro a roving paramilitary. It just uh, this is um, no. It's it, a militia. It's a it's an uh, it will be a, a militia, an official militia, in the sense that uh, it will be under the the Ministry of uh, of uh, of uh, Internal Security, uh, but uh, he will be. Uh, uh, responsible for this uh, armed group. Uh, are there uh, other, other, are there other, uh, are there other militias uh, run by other uh, political parties? Has this ever happened what, before in the history of Israel? It happened in the history of Germany, not, not exactly, exactly. Uh, um, so no, no, there was nothing like this, and uh, yes, it's it's a. Uh, um, and in, generally speaking, even if this militia will not, in the end, will not be formed, because there, there, there are some uh, uh, doubts if, if it will be really formed, the fact that Netanyahu opted to go with this Kahanist, Kahana, Kahana as you uh, mentioned, was an American-born rabbi, he uh, immigrated to Israel, formed the party that its uh, 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 manifesto was to drive out all the Arabs from Israel. Uh, uh, that was its manifesto, and it was outlawed uh, in the 90s uh, by a right-wing government, by the way, by the Likud government, it was outlawed because it was too racist even for Israeli terms. And now it uh, his hairs are really uh, uh, in government and in responsible for the police. So, yes, it's and, and Netanyahu opted really to go with them and prefer them on his classical Likud uh, 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 party. He's not abandoning the Likud party, but the more moderate side, the more conservative side of the Likud party, he just uh, abandoned them and go with Bengville and Smotrich. So, yes, it could be very, very uh, dangerous. Right. dangerous times. La last, last question. Um, your um, 
uh, uh, just read a piece by uh, uh, Hagi uh, Matar, who uh, okay, is a, a colleague of yours. Yes. Um, and one uh, thing that uh, stuck out to me was, and I have seen clips where there's there's so many Israeli flags that are being held by these protesters. Um, no Palestinian flags, and that there has been a um, a concerted effort to not have Palestinian flags in these protests, I imagine by... Uh, I saw a video uh, of someone ripping it out of someone's hand. Yes, yeah, and so. that there is... And, and um, where are the... Wh like, what is happening within the communities of both uh, Palestinian Israelis uh, and uh, occupied uh, Palestinians? Like, how are they... Like, what is you know to the extent that there is you know we can we can get a sense of 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 how they as a cohort are reacting there's you know there's a political organization there theoretically that could also you know uh, uh speak to this like what is the official and sort of less official positions they feel yes what happened with the israeli flag is very interesting it's really you know they prop really took over the protest took over the Israeli flag, who was who belonged to the right wing, and just, you know, took it to themselves. And you know, it's it's quite an intelligent move, I must say. I I don't feel very comfortable with it, but it's very intelligent because you know it disrupted, you know, the whole system. At the same time, of course, it completely estranged the Palestinian, whether they are inside Israel or in the occupied territories, uh, because, of course, uh, the flag, it's, it's the flags of the occupier. As for Palestinian flag, in the beginning, it's interesting, because in the beginning, there were some of these attacks that you mentioned, the uh, flags were being grabbed by other protesters. The, the atmosphere changed in the last uh, 12 weeks. Vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis these uh, Palestinian flags, I go every week to Tel Aviv in demonstration. There's a, what we call the the block against the occupation. A few hundred, maybe thousand, more than thousand people every every week, and we have Palestinian flags. And you know, now it's not huge number, but a few dozens, and people got got accustomed to them and above all, got accustomed to this block against the occupation, you know. They hear this uh, as slogans saying there's no democracy with occupation and uh, democracy between the river and the sea. And, you know, and they take, you know, the signs and distribute them. So I feel a, a, a an in... I wouldn't say dramatic, but there's certainly a change in the way the usual, the mainstream protesters uh, look at the uh, block against the occupation. But certainly the Palestinians feel completely estranged from this. There were some Palestinian, Israeli Palestinian, who, uh, who, part who were on, on the stage uh, in Haifa, in Beersheba, in other places, also in Tel Aviv. But it's a minority. Most of them feel that it's an internal Jewish issue. When and if we will start, and this is what I am hoping, when and if we will start really talking about basic law equality, then I think Palestinian could feel, to his Palestinian citizen of Israel, could feel more you know, at home in this, in such a struggle. Uh, it will be easier for them to identify with such a struggle, but now with the predominance of military, military slogans, military, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, presence, uh, yes, they feel, and the flags, they feel that it's not their place. Uh, Maron Rapport, uh, editor at Local uh, Call, writer at 972 Magazine. Thank you so much again for uh, keeping us updated. Uh, I imagine we will um, have an opportunity, hopefully, to, to check in with you again. It is um, it is fascinating what's what's going on there, and uh, the it does feel that we are sort of at a preface, uh, pre uh, precipice that could go 
two very radically different ways. Uh, yes. But it also does feel like the status quo is not is not holding. And so uh, something is... That's, is, that's the, I would say, the bottom line. The status quo that Netanyahu was the master of in his 15 years in power is collapsing. Maroon Where we Rapp go from now, big question. Maroon Rapport, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there you have it, folks. Um, uh, really, I think it's hard to overstate and, and and I, it, it can go, um, it can go one of, uh, it can go one of two, again, you know, radically different ways. And the thing that is really surprising to me, although, you know, on some level, it, it maybe it shouldn't have been, um, there, that there is a sort of like a, a line which cannot be crossed. And I, I am quite convinced that if I had to bet, it's not going to go the good way. Uh, but um, once you head down one of these paths, I think that the there is a, it's hard to uh, get off that path um, one way or another. So it's going to be... Uh, well, if not now, when will the United States condition its aid to Israel? I mean, there, you know, there this is, is an some story. <laughs> uh, I think there was a story actually today in uh, the Times about the U.S. pressuring the campaign, but you know about the, about this it, it, this this specific um, uh, Supreme Court reforms as it were. It's reform. It's not reform. I mean, it is a. It is undercutting the power of the court. I mean, that's just the bottom line. Um, and they've written an entire article about it, but at the end of it, it's like, it probably didn't have much impact one way or another. They did, I think, have to keep um, uh, Netanyahu from coming from the, you know, being feted at the democracy, uh, uh, you know, sort of, they were having a democracy conference and they, I think they decided, like, maybe be not a good time for you, BB, uh, to show up here. Yeah. Uh, but, I think, again, I would say um, the if you start to see a Kahanist militia in Israel, um, if they go forward with these proposals, and it doesn't feel like there is a compromise position with these, you know, proposals on either side, for that matter, and. Um, it is hard to imagine um, the United States not changing its position. By this, I mean, like, you're going to have people, it, it, you know, because there's going to be hundreds of thousands of Israelis. They're going to come back with stories of a, you know, roving militias. I mean, this is, I, I, I. I I, I think this is this is a moment that I anticipated maybe happening 10, 15 years down the road. Uh, uh, but I, I don't I just, just don't share your optimism. I think it's going to be a lot. Well, I, this is not optimism I'm talking about. Or I don't share your your sense that this is going to spur uh, any kind of meaningful change in the short term. I think it's like easy for the international community to see this as a domestic dispute or a domestic kind of uprising. And Netanyahu's relented. Like we said this two years well, ago. Well, he's relented were, now, but he's... Things were going to change when he was ousted. And, and he, now he's just back in power doing the same, same stuff. I, I, I agree. But I'm, I'm saying that I think this, this moment will play out. It may take, uh, you know, four or five months to play out. But if it resolves in a way that you have a Kahanist militia... Yeah. Uh, in the country, and that they do manage to get rid of the Supreme Court, it, I think it, it 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 is. I think there's going to be a dramatic uh, response by at least you know the biggest response that we've seen in this country to um, uh, to Israel. I would imagine because. Um, you're going to see a mass exodus, I would imagine, also from Israel. I would hope, but it's like I feel like we're we're we are doing the same song and dance with this. It doesn't. We're, we're they go further and further right. The settlements become more uh, more and more unencumbered. 
Um, we're, they're killing Palestinians in the West Bank at a record rate to start this calendar year. And the aid is still unconditional based on not just like the the relationship with Israel and, you know, how people will respond here in the United States if that relationship is severed, but because of the United States' long policy in the Middle East, where we see Israel as a strategic outpost and an indispensable partner in our objectives there, which are centered around oil um, and maintaining U.S. power. I think that's part of it, too. Like, the United States' bipartisan willingness to stand by Israel's brutality should not be underestimated. I I guess what I'm suggesting is that if what I'm talking about happens, it... um, it is not going to be a reaction to, uh, you know, Israel's treatment of the Palestinians, which I agree with you, has been um, fairly consistent (laughs) over the course of uh, decades. Uh, But it's going to be because there's going to be hundreds of thousands of secular Israelis who, um, who basically say, like, this is, you know, the Kahanis are... You know, the best way to describe them and the idea that they would have a militia, it starts becoming not hyperbole to start describing them as the Taliban. Yeah. Um, And um, I I, I think that um, the uh, I I, I think that that's going to get a different reaction by not everybody in this country. But by by major quarters, because this is what I mean, this is the whole point as to why this is a different thing, is that um, you're seeing these protests and, and it's it's almost like, you know, this is the biggest mass protest that um, a reporter who's been there for 30 years has seen. It, it doesn't even occur to say, like, well, what about the uh, intifada? Um, you yeah. know, because this is happening within the first tier of citizens in the country because that's what's so frustrating to me about this is this is still within a context that israel is a democracy israel is not a democracy it's not a democracy well i know i understand that but there we we do have this in this country and the vast majority of people sort of describe it that way it is going to be a lot harder for that fiction to be maintained for um uh for particularly the sort of commentariat to argue that when you have Kahanis uh, running around, like, you know. But the value of that argument is not as strong as you think it is. Like, well, in we'll the see. end, in the end, it's about, it is about the the values for the people in government to have Israel as our ally. And they presumably have nukes now, too. Um, and then, you know, of course, just the... I, I, I mean, the, the best argument you the have is, this, is that it. we do that with Saudi Arabia and and it, and it is and and we we maintain our our uh, relationship with Saudi Arabia. It's just that um, the, the 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 premise for our relationship is different than it's been with Saudi Arabia. And that's the only and, and that's going to have to change. But we'll see. We'll see. All right. We got to take a uh, quick break and head into the uh, fun half. Uh just a reminder, it's your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Uh, when you do, you not only allow this show to survive and thrive, um, you also uh, get the free half free of commercials. And then you get the fun half. Uh, you can IM the show with the app, the majority app. Um, all right. Uh, ESVN, what happened yesterday? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, we broke down all of the angles, and there are many, to the Lamar Jackson trade request and uh, contract negotiations. We also spoke about the anti-LGBTQ um, swell in the NHL, how it's just a systemic problem for them, um, as well as the importance of the World Baseball Classic and growing the game. Uh, YouTube.com slash ESPN show. And uh, Matt is going to be on extended vacation, uh, as it were, uh, in the grand jury uh, uh, doing his civic duty. Uh, but he's going to be home for uh, Left Reckoning. Yes, it should be tonight. Uh, suspicious. I, I will definitely You're ask very him suspicious. for more guest info at youtube.com slash Left Reckoning, patreon.com slash Left Reckoning for the post game, And uh, follow our TikTok, guys, at Majority Report FM. 
we uh, have. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yes. We've been uh, our our uh, our in- intern Isaac, who is now a full time Isaac, has been doing great work there. And uh, our Twitter account just posted a great uh, excerpt from our interview with Clara Matei from January about austerity. Very Sweet, nice. pass Check that stuff out. around. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Be right back. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? What, who sent us this? <laughs> alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back, and the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back, and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, back. Snowflakes says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar, what a, wow, what a fucking nightmare! What a fucking nightmare! nightmare. bring back DJ Denner. Yeah, or a couple of them, just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. See white people doing drugs, they look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Snowflake says what? 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 A hell of a lot of bank. Okay, I'm making stupid money. Hell of, hell, hell, <laughs> hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> a hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> All lives matter. <laughs> Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are back, 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 back. When you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on. Fuck them. Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday. It's my birthday. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are black. Black. Africans are back. Back. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Blast. Come on. Someone needs to pay the price for blast to be around here. We're back, Sam Cedar, and soon to be Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Uh, Sam from Ottawa, what's the over under on this argument till we revisit and see who is right? Six months. Huh. Uh, I would say, let's just call it the end of the year. Although I, I do think that we're going to have a, a better sense in a month, at least as to like, it, it feels like